Glenn Dennis, a mortuary worker whose workplace and residence just happened to be within the most prolific and controversial UFO hotspots of all time, Roswell, New Mexico, has a story that is well worth a listen. What did Glenn see that forced him to tell his terrifying tale after more than 40 years of silence? Was there really a UFO crash near a military base that resulted in the recovery of extraterrestrial beings? And what happened to those who got too close to the bodies and to the truth? Join us as we listen carefully to the testimony of Mr. Glenn Dennis and decide for ourselves whether his story is true or false. Welcome to Destination Declassified. As ever, it's best to get a bit of background with regards to the situation and to Glenn Dennis himself before we delve into the 1990 interview which cemented his status as one of the most polarizing figures in UFO history. We won't delve into Roswell, as we all know that story, but let's find out a bit about Glenn. Glenn Dennis was born March 24, 1925 in Abilene, a large populated city within the US state of Texas. Having moved to Roswell during his high school years, Dennis took up a part-time job at the local funeral home in 1940, where he worked as an assistant to the mortuary staff, as well as studying at Roswell High. Upon graduating, Dennis was excused for participating in military service due to hearing impairments, and so he continued working in the Ballard Funeral Home, taking up an apprenticeship as an embalmer. Much to his delight, Dennis graduated from the San Francisco College of Mortuary Science on the 22nd of December 1946 and quickly got to work in his new role of the home's military contracts. He would regularly attend the Roswell Army Airfields Ambulance and Mortuary Divisions to assist with those unfortunate souls who perished whilst in combat or training missions. The site would be renamed Walker Air Force Base in 1948. During his time at Ballard, the young man became extremely meticulous and attentive to not only the bodies of those within the mortuary, but to the notes, records, and logging of information for each and every body that passed through its doors. This would come in handy later on. After only a year of working at the funeral home and in partnership with Walker Air Base, Dennis would encounter something that would stay with him for the rest of his life and remain a secret for more than 40 years. Dennis would state that only his father, for whom he was extremely close, and the American nuclear physicist Stanton Terry Friedman, a professional ufologist, were privy to his story before he agreed to be interviewed for television in 1990. Though many questioned the testimony of fellow UFO witness Gerald Anderson, the man who was allegedly present at the original crash site of the now world-famous Roswell incident, Dennis would stick to his story and bravely put himself in the spotlight ill bit under the name W. Glenn Davis. The interview in question was filmed and uploaded onto the United States National Archives website under an anonymous author and is seemingly the only unedited record of the conversation that was conducted by the unseen and unnamed interviewers. Dennis appears calm, collected and happy to discuss the events that took place as he sits in front of a curtained background with his arms folded, awaiting the first question. If one wishes to watch the conversation in full, which we'll put a link in the description to, it is evident from the outset that the manner in which the interview is conducted is not professional in any way, from sound issues to retakes and interruptions. The 40 minute video is as raw as it gets and worth a second view at least. And so, with the camera rolling, Dennis begins to tell a tale that dates back to 1947 to a time where flying saucers, aliens and conspiracy theories would dominate the headlines and scare many people, including Dennis, for life. The day started like any other. It was around 1.30pm on a Sunday afternoon in July when Dennis received a telephone call whilst tending to his duties at the funeral home by an officer at the Walker Air and Army Base. As mentioned, this was not uncommon and so Dennis prepared himself to hear about another unfortunate death within the ranks of the US military and Air Force, and readied himself to be asked 
to go down and help. However, the questions asked of him rendered him confused but alert to a mystery that would continue throughout his life. Dennis recalls being asked by the officer what would be the smallest possible casket that could be hermetically sealed, which means to make something airtight. After careful thought, he replied that the minimal airtight dimensions would be 3 foot 6 inches. After 45 minutes, another call came through from the same officer with another question. What preparations are made and what procedures are carried out to decomposing bodies that have been exposed to various elements? Dennis answered the questions accordingly by going through the due process, such as filling up the storage vats with formaldehyde solution and water to preserve the bodies for 24 hours. From there, he would use sawdust and lime to wrap them up and aspirate the cavities. The officer seemed a little baffled by the detailed procedure and asked what difference all of this would make to the blood, skin and internal chemicals within the decomposed bodies, and if there was a risk of high contamination, which in the words of the officer was for future reference. At this point, Dennis was beginning to suspect something serious was going on at the base, and proposed a short-term solution of sourcing as much dry ice as possible to help preserve the bodies, and offered two or three times to drive down to the base and help, an offer which was bluntly rejected. A few hours later, Dennis received yet another call from the base. This time he was asked to attend the care of a severely injured airman, who may perish by the time he got to the site. Already curious as to the mysterious nature of the previous telephone calls, Dennis grabbed his coat and headed for the medical headquarters, where he normally reported to. He walked straight through the doors to find the airman still alive. He assisted with first aid techniques before stepping aside to allow the nurses and doctors through to continue their assessment and examination of the patient. It was at this time that he spotted a female colleague and friend, whom he had dealt with on numerous occasions at the terminal. Before he could say hello, she approached him with extreme caution and concern. The lady who isn't named in the interview, but whose identity was discussed and questioned at a later date, told him to leave the facility as soon as possible, or else he would find himself in serious trouble by the attending lieutenant who was on duty. Dennis was given no time to process this order from his colleague before an officer stopped him in his tracks, requesting his clearance credentials and reason for being on the site. When Dennis explained to him his position and the calls he had been receiving, he was shocked when the officer told him that there was in fact no such crash, or indeed any dead bodies that had been recovered earlier that day. Another officer stepped forward to support his colleague's declaration and proceeded to threaten Dennis if he decided to investigate the matter further by saying that his colleagues would be picking your bones out of the sand. He was then physically escorted out of the building and followed back to the Ballard funeral home by the same officers in an unmarked vehicle. As the interview continues, Dennis's demeanor remains calm throughout, with the exception of the odd stutter or fidgeting with his hands whilst he recounts his tale and backtracking to his initial arrival at the airbase on that strange evening. He claims that upon parking his vehicle in the designated parking area next to a fleet of vehicles, he had looked into one of the ambulances whose doors were slightly open. Damaged debris, consistent with that of aerial crashes, was visible inside and measured approximately 2 feet by 3 feet in length. According to Dennis, it looked like stainless steel with a bluish resin and resembled the shape of a canoe. Interestingly, he describes the broken pieces as displaying Egyptian-like hieroglyphs and symbols, which were carved and embedded into the craft. Although he did not think much of the visual at the time, nor was it mentioned during his recalling of the events as it played out, this piece of descriptive evidence is significant to ufologists, and potentially game-changing when one investigates and considers the origins of extraterrestrial civilizations and or life forms. Getting back to his story, Dennis expressed his concern for his female colleague, as well as his curious nature that dictated his next move which was to call the base and ask to speak with her directly and privately. Luckily, she was able to speak briefly on the receiver and agreed to meet him for lunch at the local officers' club, a venue to which both Dennis and his colleague had membership and access to. It was immediately evident that she was not her normal self, expressing fear and anxiety throughout their discussion, 
as well as physical stress that resulted in her not touching her food once. The unnamed associate discreetly pulled out a diagram which she had personally drawn by hand that showed three bodies supposedly found at the crash site, two of which were completely mutilated and unidentifiable. However, one of the entities appeared to have survived a little longer. Each of the corpses were between three foot and four feet tall and resembled a creature or animal rather than displaying human characteristics. The interviewers proceeded to ask Dennis to repeat the descriptions of the bodies on a few occasions in order to be sure of the distinctive features as well as safeguarding the audio recording on their equipment. Dennis proceeds to explain and describe what he saw on the drawings. Large heads with no teeth and rawhide gums, as well as two very small holes for ears, with lobe flaps covering them, and two small holes for nostrils just above the lips. The formation of the head and face is not unlike that which we associate alien-like beings to have. According to the drawings and physical description by the woman, the mysterious visitors had remarkably delicate hands, complete with long fingers, which although they had no thumbs or fingernails, displayed suction cups on the tips of each finger. Attached to these overly long hands were short arms, whose wrist to elbow length was double the size compared to the elbow to shoulder measurements. Most significantly were the eyes, which were set back into the creature's skull structure, which appeared inordinately fragile. The skin was almost transparent. The beings were not clothed, nor were they distinguishable by age or sex, something that Dennis remembers very well, and unlike anything his female colleague had seen before, in all of the years working in the military. Another oddity regarding the identity of those involved was the doctors who brought the bodies in for examination. According to the lieutenant, she had never seen or met them before in her life. As their awkward lunch came to an end, Dennis asked if she knew where the remains were taken, but she didn't. With this statement, she got up and left abruptly, leaving Glenn shaken, confused, and with more questions than answers. Unafraid of the consequences to his inquiry, Dennis would continue to try and meet, or at least contact his colleague, in the hope that more information would become available to either of them. After a few months of attempting to speak with her, he was told that she had been transferred to another site, despite being relatively new to Walker Air Base. This immediately raised his concern. Fortunately, two weeks later, he would receive a letter from his friend, which, though brief, explained how she was now stationed in London, and quoted her army post office number. Relieved to have heard from her, Dennis wrote back to wish her well and to stay safe. Not even a month later, a notification came through on the APO number, which Dennis was able to obtain and read on behalf of the lieutenant. It showed just a single word in red lettering in relation to her status. Deceased. When Dennis demanded to know what happened to her, he was told that she, along with five other nurses, were killed in a plane crash during a training mission. When asked if he accepts this to be the truth, he categorically states that he doesn't believe the narrative whatsoever and wishes that she is alive and well somewhere and hopes to see her again. The interview draws close to the end at this point and only a few questions and elements of testimony by Dennis remain on the recording. Dennis goes on to reveal that the very next day after he saw the debris at the airbase and was escorted home, his father told him that he had been contacted by the local sheriff and close friend George Wilcox. Apparently one of the sergeants who forced Glenn off the property had asked the sheriff about the Dennis family members, as well as their close friends and affiliates. Having a brother who was in the Air Force and a sister who was a nurse, naturally Dennis's father became concerned for his family's safety. It was then that he told his father the story of what happened, a secret both men would keep for a very long time. As the interview comes to an end, there is enough time for one last question surrounding the information and documentation that Dennis prided himself on keeping up to date and securely stored. When Ballard Funeral Home was sold years later, all of his military files, including the copies and drawings of his friend, had suddenly gone missing before he could retrieve them. Coincidence? Dennis certainly thinks so. This is where the interview ends. 
In 1991, Dennis founded the International UFO Museum and Research Center in Roswell, New Mexico. Although he would appear in the hotline segment of an episode of Unsolved Mysteries, which featured the Roswell UFO incident, his interview would develop a cult following and get people talking, even to this very day, on the validity of his testimony. His account was prominently featured in the 1992 book, Crash at Corona, as well as The Truth About the UFO Crash at Roswell, published in 1994. Skeptics have naturally reviewed the video and offered their opinion on Dennis' story. Carl Flock and Kevin Randall, both ufologists and investigators, note some inconsistencies which they claim to have found, including the identity of a nurse who Dennis claimed was a witness to the alleged alien autopsies, and the need for Dennis' own involvement in any embalming process. Another book which recounts the events that took place in 1947 Witness to Roswell, Unmasking the Six-Year Cover-Up by Thomas Carey and Donald Schmidt, published in 2007. The credibility of Dennis is called into question due to him providing researchers with a false name of the female lieutenant. They state, His surprising and disappointing response was, I gave you a phony name because I promised her that I would never reveal it to anyone. Carey and Schmidt go on to say that Dennis was found to have knowingly provided false information to investigators and must technically stand impeached as a witness. Sadly, Glenn Dennis died in 2015, aged 90, having only spoken to a limited group of people about what he supposedly witnessed that day, in July 1947. He maintained, to the very end, that what he saw and reported was the truth, and took this declaration to his grave. What do you think? In a world where everything we say and write is scrutinized, taken out of context or manufactured to fit a certain narrative, it may be, perhaps, that the biggest conspiracy of all is not what we say, but what we want to hear and believe as truth. You may not have heard of Glenn Dennis or his story, but perhaps there is reason for this. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Destination Declassified, and we look forward to seeing you in the next one. As ever, keep searching and asking questions.